All right, our message this morning uh, is the deception of no problem Christianity. Uh, we have been dealing with deception ever since Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were deceived into believing that if they would just eat that fruit, whatever it was, uh, they were going to become gods. They were deceived into that. If we would look at Samson, he was deceived into believing he could sleep with the enemy and not lose his purpose or his passion. Uh, David trying to deceive the nation when he committed adultery with Bathsheba that somehow he could deceive the people into believing nothing happened. Uh, so we are born into sin, and one of those sinful issues we have is deception. Uh, we don't want, in fact, uh, we don't want people to know how bad things are in our lives, too. It can be. Uh, people ask, well, how are you doing? Well, everything's good. I, I wonder sometimes it would be like if you said, if someone asked you those questions and through the whole day you had to say exactly how you felt, you couldn't just brush it off. I wonder if people say, well, how are you doing? Do you really want to hear about it? You know, you probably have people saying, well. We are measured by the enemy in how he can deceive us especially when it comes to temptations. Uh, even if we were to go back to David, I would wonder if, if the enemy was preparing well ahead of time for how he was going to get David by maybe just taking a look, a sideward glance somewhere. And uh, David says, no, I'm not going to do that because uh, we were told by Job, we're not supposed to look at maidens, especially when we've got a wife. We don't need to look at someone else. And then the second time, well, maybe it wasn't so bad, then the third time all of a sudden we got problems. Deception is like erosion in the sense that it causes our faith to be eroded away. And when we start rejecting truth, we settle for something else. And when we reject truth, what we end up with is lies. <clears throat> the problem is, and especially in our world, we would rather believe lies than truth. We would rather be deceived. The fact that there's a song, I don't know why it just came to my mind right now, it's not that I listened to that song, but there's a title of a song, Tell Me Lies, Tell Me Sweet Little Lies. What is that all about? That's what we want to hear. Don't tell me the truth. I want to hear something that is uh, uh, pleasing to me. And America... I think is being devastated right now because we want lies. We want to believe that the two men that we've got up for president are the two best men we could ever come up with. You know, and we lie to ourselves or we try to tell people, you know, hey, these things are all right. Uh, but I want to focus more on our Christian faith and the deception that can come out there and, and I've heard it, you've probably heard it in songs. Whenever you come to Jesus, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be pie in the sky, no problems, because when you come to Jesus, everything's going to be all right. Uh, that's not a bill of goods I want to try and sell. Because yes, when we come to Jesus Christ, He forgives our sins and He can help us to conquer all of the bad habits, all of our attitudes, and some of those take a lifetime to overcome. It's not like when we come to Jesus, everything is going to be okay because if we were to look at Jesus' life, He had struggles from the beginning to the end. Uh, here's a couple of Examples I want to look at at how people do that. Uh, there's a televangelist worth $760 million. And I just looked up this week to make sure I was correct on that. At the last count. He, he has his own $20 million jet, among other smaller jets, his own private runway, and his $10.8 million estate. And he tries to tell us, if we are faithful to God and, of course, to Him by sending Him our tithes and our offerings, we will experience a blessed bank account and good health. Uh, 
I didn't say that, so we can... Another con man, and, and this guy, I remember seeing him back in the 80s. He said, send me your prayer requests. We are going to pray for you. And uh, what happened, interestingly, later on, is uh, it came out that all these big bags, big garbage bags full of prayer requests were coming to him. Unfortunately, by the time he got them, all of the donations were taken out and put aside. And what he did is he would lay on the garbage bags, have a quick prayer, and off to the dumpster they went. But he did pray over those. Uh, and from another so a number of sources, we find another pastor with the big smile. And I remember my wife saying, you need to smile like this pastor because he's got this beautiful smile in the pulpit. And he is in Houston. And from his book sales and from his church, he pulls in $55 million a year. And he built not long ago a $10 million mansion because God said, treat your wife to a beautiful thing like this. And I look at these things, brethren, and I say, you know what? First of all, I say, am I in the right denomination? That's the first question I ask. But we are giving these empty promises that when you come to Jesus, all your sorrows are gone. All your troubles, your health scares, your financial hardships, they're all going to be gone because why? We're supposed to smile and say, because Jesus loves you. He loves us. And we are not worthy of all the gifts He gives us in life. But brethren, I believe the closer a person gets to God, the more challenges and the more hardships you're going to have. Why? Because we got an enemy who does not want us to have a relationship with God. So he's going to try his best to steal, to kill, and to destroy all that Jesus has given to us. So I want to say hallelujah, thank you that we've got a Savior who loves and cares for us. But brethren, we have to realize when we are born into a sinful nature, death is a part of life. And we don't like to face that. We like to have the idea, somehow I'm going to beat all of this. We can't. A lot of us get sick. I was even talking to, I remember one man of another congregation that we pastored one time, and he says, if you are faithful to Jesus, you're never going to get sick. And I brought up to him, well, what about Elisha? And it says in, in is it 1 Kings or 2 Kings, that uh, Elisha's talking to the king, and it says the sickness wherewith Elisha died. David, when he died, he had problems staying warm. What kind of an issue that was, we don't know, but brethren, whether you follow Jesus or not, we're all going to die. We're all going to get sick from time to time in our life. And God does bless us and God does heal us. But brethren, these are things that are part of being a human being. We're going to get sick. We're going to have people who die, who our hearts are going to be broken for. That's part of life. So to say when you become a Christian, these things you're not going to experience anymore, they're, they're telling you the wrong thing. That's the underlying problem, that Jesus will fix everything. Brethren, I've heard of people who were uh, real bad smokers, who came to Jesus, who died of that lung cancer started asking, well, if Jesus forgave me, why did he let me? You know why? Because he, he smoked. We do things that God allows us to do, but we have to suffer the circumstances for why we do. Amen. That does not mean that God cannot heal us and forgive us. He does from time to time. But at the very point that I would take there is, if, you know what? When Jesus heals and forgives in the sense of our spiritual sickness, that's the most important thing. We're all going to die. I, I, what, what did I hear? The statistics were one in one when it comes to dying. You're all going to die. Amen. The problem is, is are we right with Jesus Christ? And can Jesus help with these issues? Many of us, if we had te uh, testimony service of the miracles of God, He does do miracles. But He's not going to answer everyone. That doesn't mean he doesn't love and care for us. The call to Jesus is the call to discipleship. That means 
And, and I was thinking about this other day. You know what? When we get sick, there are still angelic beings praising God 24 hours a day, all the time in heaven. So whether we get sick or not, there's still praise going on. And I think God even says, in everything give thanks, for this is Christ's will for us. So whether we're having the worst day of our lives or not, God is still worthy of our praise. He is. If we focus on the temporary brethren, Christianity is not going to make sense. Because then we eat and drink, but tomorrow we're going to die. I'm looking at long term and saying, I may have to suffer all these things, but hallelujah, my, my name is written in glory and so is yours. So, there's a, so the one side of the coin is Jesus forgives sins, hallelujah. There are great blessings of healings that happen. In fact, I, I am appreciative of Brother David and Sister Jolie when they talk about this great uh, healing that took place in their family. I can talk about not having epilepsy anymore. God does bring great miracles. But we cannot sell people a false set of goods saying, well, if you just come to Jesus, all this is going to go away. He may bring us through it, and He may heal us from it, but there's still going to be problems we're going to have to go through. Let's go to Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Hebrews 5. Uh, you know, if any man should never have suffered anything in his life, it should have been who? Jesus Christ. The perfect man, sinless, right? He never should have suffered anything. But we've got Hebrews 5, verse 8. The Son of God. Hebrews 5 and verse 8. It says, Though He were a Son, referring to being the Son of God, Son of the Almighty. Yet learned he obedience. How did he learn obedience? By the things which he suffered. We don't like it. You know, I was thinking about what would be a good illustration. You got a thousand people down the road, all dressed in white robes, all Christians, beautiful, wonderful, God saved people, all there. And every once in a while, here comes this guy in this kind of a black robe going by and handing people every once in a while this notice. And they open it up one says, you're going to be sick. And other than, you're going to suffer this. You're going to watch your children go through this. And I'm thinking, how many people on that row are going to keep their faith when they're handed this envelope? You know, we think of, what was the name of that song we just had? Uh, I'd rather not, I'd rather have Jesus. It was uh, not yours. It was the one before that, uh, a piano player. She was going to go into a professional, be a professional piano player. Yeah, and so Annie Jensen, okay. Guess what? Most of her hymns were sung when? She was suffering from uh, a severe form of arthritis. She got down to the point where she was less than four feet tall because the bones were going like this on her. She could barely use her fingers, and they'd had to tape uh, Crayola chalk so she could write while she was suffering on this bed. And I think she also had cancer, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yet, through all of that, what does she say? In her last song she ever wrote, which was what? He giveth more grace. She suffered to write that last song, they said, horribly. And yet, she wrote this beautiful song while she was suffering. And brethren, I want to challenge us, which means I'm challenging myself. We need to have a spirit of grace through the good and the bad times. And that beautiful song that's sung by, uh, uh, he's the same God on the mountain as he is in the valley. He is. He is worthy of our praise, whether we've had the best day of our life or the worst day in our life. That's what the Christian life is all about. God is leading us through these hard times to bring us towards uh, his kingdom. And look at Jesus. What did it say, Hebrews 5.8? What did Jesus have to learn? He was omniscient. Am I not right about that? Is he not all-knowing? Was he not given that attribute? Yes, he was. And yet it said he had to what? Learn. Learn what? Through suffering. And that tells us, brethren, from this scripture just alone, we are going to suffer because God's teaching us things in our life. What are the, some of the things we're going to learn? That God is good all the time. That he'll bring us through the hard times. 
and that God loves us no matter the circumstances we have. We need to learn those lessons, brethren. Paul suffered and told Timothy, all who live godly shall what? So brethren, if you're not suffering, there might be a problem there. All who live godly shall suffer persecution. It's a Christian fact of life. We are going to suffer. Now, pastor, you don't want us to dwell on that saying, hi, I'm a Christian and I'm suffering. I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is God is worth it all. When Jesus comes again, we're going to say it was worth it all. We're not going to dwell in eternity. Oh, Jesus we need to look at all the things I suffered in my life. Are we going to be saying that? We are going to be praising Jesus for bringing us through that and bringing us home. Romans 8, verses 17 and 18. We're going to take a few scriptures and look about suffering here. And brethren, I don't like to think about suffering. You know why? I want a carefree life, don't you? Who wants to say, God, I just want you to do something bad for me today. I need to suffer. No one wakes up saying that. We want to be as blessed and as happy as we can be. And yet God does not say that's the way it's going to be all the time. Romans 8, 17 and 18. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What did we just read about in Hebrews 5, 8? He learned suffering. So if we're a joint heir with Jesus we're going to jointly suffer with Jesus. Am I right on that? Do you remember, I'm just going to pull off for a second, Acts the fourth chapter. The disciples were beaten up because of the name of Jesus Christ and they went to the rest of their buddies and they were rejoicing because they were found worthy to suffer. Are we going to be happy in Jesus' suffering? They did. They got beat up for it. If so be that we suffer, what? With him, that we may also be glorified together. We come to Jesus Christ, but we're going to take a road that's called a suffering road. There is going to be grace. There is going to be joy in those days. But brethren, there's going to be hard days too. For I reckon, what is this Paul saying? That the sufferings of this present time are are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Why? We're going to have these new resurrection bodies. And brethren, I believe suffering causes us to appreciate more what God does for us. I don't want to see any... You know, when I went to go visit with Lisa this week on Friday, and you go by these rooms, and brethren, you cannot help but see all these people in these beds. And you know, one thought that comes to me is, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be in that bed seeing these people like that. What kind of an existence is that? That's how I feel because, and if, you, if I said to all of you, who wants to go with me? We're going to go visit these. That's not going to be your first place you want to go. Why? Because we don't want to see that. And yet Jesus says, I want you to see what breaks my heart. So you go through and then you just start praying, God, please be with these people. And God, be with the workers who are doing the work. I don't think they get enough accolades for the stuff they do. Uh, that's where we go see Lisa. We want God to do something for her. And even if not, then we are there to comfort her. So there are things we need to do. Remember Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, what did he say? Take up your what? Your cross. No, 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 no. I want the crown. I don't want that cross. And yet Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you take up your cross and follow me. You know why most people don't want to follow Jesus? The cost is too high. 1 Peter 4. Brethren, I am not here saying, let's just... Pray that God's going to bring us suffering, but I do want to bring forth a point. We are going to have times where life is not going to make sense, and we're going to ask God why, because God is big enough to take that question. 1 Peter 4, verses 1 to 3. For as much then as Christ has what? Suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourself likewise. What is he saying? Prepare your mind. Prepare your, uh, your ideal thoughts of life 
to remember you're going to suffer too. Suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with it. You know what the arm yourselves means? It's actually putting on the armor. Arm yourself, get ready because you're going to suffer. It's just going to happen. With the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Do you know what I take from this point? I'm getting the idea the closer you get to God, the more suffering you're going to experience. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness or our desires, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So he's saying, listen, you are going to suffer in life. Whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to suffer. But Jesus gives us the power to go through it. Now, let's go to verses 12 to 14. Same chapter. Beloved, now here he goes. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Is that suffering? Which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. Ah, that's the hard thing to do is to rejoice when we're going through hard times. Inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Brethren, let me tell you something. I've had toothaches in my life enough to know that there's suffering when you have a toothache. And when that tooth is pulled or whatever, you feel a whole lot better after it's all said and done. And I think sometimes God allows to suffering so that we can experience that joy and peace with him. When all is said and done. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. You know, and I'm guilty. So what do you do for a living? Me? Oh. Or why don't you why don't you eat this or why do you do that? And uh we don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to struggle with people. So guess what? Okay, I guess we're putting this back up. There we go. We don't want to suffer. Well, why don't you think this is right? You know what? We don't want to have people upset with us. We don't want to have people reject us. We go through us. So you know what? The best way to do it, what is the easiest way to get through this so I don't have to suffer? And that's wrong for me. Jesus calls us to suffer. Calls us to walk with him where he walked. Remember that song? I walked today where Jesus walked. What was that supposed to tell us in that music? I walked and I took the suffering that Jesus suffered with. That's, that's, a, that's a, something that, brethren, I think we can learn to do. If we be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and of God. What? Rests upon you. Brethren, if we're going through troubles, God's happy with us. Because why? Something is happening in our lives that is going to bring God's glory out in us. Now, I'm sure if we go back to David and Jolie, when their daughter was suffering, and you were suffering with them, and you saw the glory of God come, and you've got a testimony that the world needs to hear. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Somehow it is that when we suffer, glory comes to God. Glory comes. Just like when Jesus said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, verses 6 to 14. There's a lot to be said about suffering, brethren, in these scriptures, probably more than we'd like to take notice of. 1 Timothy 1, Verse 6, 1 Timothy 1, verse 6. From whence some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for unholy and profane, 
for murderers, for fathers, murderers of mothers, and manslayers. Ooh, I think I'm on the wrong scripture here. Well, we'll skip that one, but that was a good scripture. Uh, we'll, we'll take that off of there later on. Let's go to Philippians. I'm sorry. I don't know where I have it, but I'm sorry on that one. Let's go to Philippians 3, verses 7 to 10. Is it? I don't have a... I gave you some reasons already. Let's see if this will work. 2 Timothy 1. Mm, you know what? That's fine. Let's go to Philippians. Philippians 3, verses 7 to 10. And I'll find out later on that you're right, Micah. Philippians 3, verses 7 to 10. This is speaking about... Well, that, you know, let's go to verse 5 on this. Philippians 3, but we're going to start with verse... No, you know what? Let, let me go back here. Uh, we're going to do something real different. I'm going to add a scripture for you. Let's go to Philippians 2 for just a second before we get to the third chapter. Philippians 2... And let's start with verse 5. And this is submission to suffering that he was going to do. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What's the mind he's thinking of here? Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He knew where he was going as soon as he was born on earth. He knew what was going to happen to him. All of his life, he was going to be seen suffering. If we want to take a good picture, we go to Isaiah 53. A man acquainted with what? Sorrows and suffering. And yet for the joy of what he was going to do, he saw that as he was willing to do. Are we willing to suffer so that others can receive joy? This is what Jesus... Now let's go to the third chapter, verses 7 to 10. <clears throat> uh, the Apostle Paul is speaking about his personal life and what he's gone through. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ... Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He lost everything he had. You know, when he was a Pharisee, he had it pretty good. And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. What is he saying? I am willing to suffer if I receive Jesus. If I receive that gift of eternal life. And be found of him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him. Now, here we, you know, this is a beautiful scripture. And we like the first part of it. That I may know him. And we all want to know Jesus, don't we? And the power of his resurrection. Don't we want the resurrection life? We need that, brethren. But then he says something else here. And the fellowship of his what? We well, want to leave that part out a little bit. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I don't want to die. That's, it. That's our part of our, our being. We want to live as long as possible. And Paul says, we need to be willing to die. Remember what Paul said in another place, I do mortify my flesh I die daily, he says. Why? So Christ can live in me. And somehow it is, the more suffering we do, the more we experience the power of God in our life. We want to skip that one, though. Verse 10, speaking of his fellowship, of his sufferings, and we know that, old, that, that song, The Old Rugged Cross, it's a beautiful song to sing, but just keep the cross out there and not so close to myself. But we, if we're going to live as Jesus wants us to live, we have to suffer. <laughs> Can you imagine putting up on here, we're going to paint that sign over, the suffering church of God, Seventh Day. You wouldn't have people come visit this church. Now, if we put on there the celebration, 
Church of God, Seventh Day, come to our potlucks. They're the best you're going to have. People are happy. Yeah, I think we'd have more people. And then if you had a church down the street, the suffering church, well, no, we're going to go to this one here first. We have to realize, brethren, suffering is a part of a church and a part of a person who is maturing in Christ. Let's go to Matthew 6. And we're going to end with some of Jesus' teachings this morning. Matthew, the 6th chapter, verses 24 to 26. What does Jesus tell us about suffering? Matthew 16, verses 24 to 26. Did I put that wrong down there? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's after that. I know some of you have to suffer with my preaching. Well, what's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, Matthew 16. I'm sorry, I said 6. There we go. Well, now you guys can come to Jesus one day and say, I had to suffer under this pastor for a while, you know. And Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Here we go. Then said Jesus unto his disciples. And you know, let's think about John for a second. You are my disciples if you do something. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him what? Deny his neighbor and take up his cross and follow me. What does it say? Deny himself. I don't want to do that. You know, can I be very honest with you? Uh, when potluck begins, I would love to be the first one in line. I, uh, I just say that for you now. I'm being very honest with you. I hope you still like me after I'm done the message here. But you and, and Paul and Jason, I'll see you, they're always the last ones. And I praise God for them. They're keeping up a good work there. Uh, I just am not a person who wants to be last. I am. I don't mind saying that. Especially when you ladies bring such good-looking food up there. I don't want to be last. I'd like to be first. And yet Jesus says we need to deny ourselves and take up. It means you don't go first. I remember with my brothers and I, and my dad had the belt up because you all did something wrong. And we were always fighting over who was going to go first. I always wanted to go last. I was wrong. Because when we were in this room listening to the belt hit the rear end on one of my brothers, I should have been first. Because in, when I, I'm done crying, they're just going up there to get theirs, right? No, I wanted to be less. Somehow I'm going to spare them. Spare myself from what? Those two are done, and they're just about done crying. And I was hoping maybe my dad would be tired by that time. He wouldn't have so much on that belt anymore. We need to realize, brethren, Jesus came to be a servant and he came to be last of all. Why do I say that? At the Lord's Supper, what was he doing to the disciples' feet? Washing their feet. And then he comes in later and says, I am going to suffer. And he's, I think in a sense, almost begging them to say, stay with me because this is hard for me to go through. And yet he was willing to suffer for his friends. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Brethren, we've got to be willing to die to self and die to this life. This is what Jesus is telling us. For what, uh, you know what? I want to live to be a very old man and to see my kids' grandchildren. That doesn't mean that's God's plan for my life. And I have to accept whatever God has put before me. Be thankful in all things, it says. For what is a man profited? Look at this. If he shall gain the whole world, this is what we want as people, right? Give me first place in potluck line. I want it first. And lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So he's putting it out simply. If you want to live like that, you're going to lose. But if you want to sacrifice your life and be honorable to Jesus Christ, you're going to get your life. I don't believe in these people have your best life now. I don't want this life and say that this life is my best life now. An eternal life is my best life. Yeah. 
So why am I trying to exchange there or do something like that? Let's close with Matthew, the sixth chapter. Matthew 6. No, Said, I did have it at 16, so I just made a mistake there. And you guys are suffering too. Like I say, to hear my messages, God build you up. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. You know what we want to do, right? I want as much money as I can in that bank account, because this pastor on TV said, if I start worshiping Jesus, my bank account's going to go crazy. All of a sudden, I'm looking there one day, and where did I get all this money from? And I'm going to have good health. And all my friends are going to be good. You see? And what is Jesus telling us here? Lay not up for yourselves. Don't look for things that are temporary. Look for things that have eternal value. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And the devil is always trying to steal from us. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is your treasure? Is it in this life? This life is a call to what I've been talking about, suffering. But you know what? There's great glory in serving the Lord. Amen. I would rather suffer now and have Jesus than have a carefree life and face judgment one day. Amen. Something about suffering, God is, he finds such great glory in our lives because when we suffer, who, who isn't it? If, if one of our kids, remember when they're little and they had a headache or something, they'd come to us, what do you want to do for them? Here, let's give you something to take away that headache. We want to help them. Isn't God going to do that for us? And God is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why does he allow long-suffering? For us, because somehow, some way, we're going to have a testimony to give to other people who need to hear the truth. Suffering, it's a mark of a maturing Christian. Father in heaven, we thank you that you asked your son Jesus to come and suffer for us with the beatings, with the rejection. He came unto his own, but his own received him not, and finally crucified, and yet the glory that was revealed on resurrection morning was worth it all. Lord, help us to realize we are called to a life that does show the world. We praise a God who is alive today. But Lord, help us also to realize there are going to be days that are going to be suffering. But Lord, you're going to lead us through that suffering because of the power of Jesus that rests on our hearts and our lives. We praise you and thank you that in all things we can give thanks to our God. In Jesus' name, amen.